Yes, yeah, Sudarshan, you can start. Hello, very good evening and welcome to our webinar today. Before we start our presentations, uh, let me talk a little bit about the platform. Uh, we will start our presentation shortly. Uh, I will request all the audience to write the name in the chat box while and your, uh, if you are a student or a professional and the city you are uh, attending from. And if you are attending this webinar from outside India, please also mention the name of the country. We have given an example like Akanka students and uh, city, name of the city also. For better audio, for audio visit, you should use headphones. And I will request all of you to mute your microphone throughout the webinars. You can, you can send your questions to the chat box. And at the end of our presentation, during the question and sessions, we will post our uh, couple of handouts for your information that those handouts will be very useful. You should uh, download them in on your desktop or computers and use them in the future. Uh, we are very glad to inform you that we are conducting a series of webinars uh, graduate application camp, which started on August 20. We have already presented three uh, webinars, and today, September 15, we have the webinars on the PhD application and auto communications. There are three more webinars uh, coming in the next couple of weeks, so I will strongly encourage all students and participants to attend this webinar, and you will get fruitful information for those. And today our topic is the PhD application, art of communication and writing sample. This is a very important topic for graduate students. I will try to provide you inf uh, information um, uh, which will be very useful, and some, some kind of practical uh, information that is actually that you need to know uh, when, you, uh, uh, when you start applying to your uh, uh, graduate department. Uh, before that, let me just tell you about the agendas of today's sessions. So, some of you may be already aware about the Education USA, others probably attending this session for the first time. So, I will little bit talk about Education USA and our services. Then I will introduce our co-presenters. Uh, we are very lucky that we have two diverse presenters from two different kind of U.S. universities in U.S. And after our presentation, three of us, then uh, we will have question and answer session. So each presenter will talk about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, roughly, we will take one hour, and then we will keep around 30 minutes for the question and answer session. At the end. And then we'll take a couple of minutes to wrap up. With that, I will start my presentations uh, about Education USA. Education USA is a very large network around the globe. Uh, it has, sorry. Uh, it is supported by the Department of State Government of US and we have around 430 plus Education USA advising center in 170 countries. So you can imagine that it's a very large network around the globe and we provide accurate, comprehensive, and current information about higher education in the US. Most importantly, that we provide information about all accredited universities and colleges. We do not give any biased information. So because we are representing the government of US, Department of State, we give information about all US universities and colleges which are accredited, and a degree from, a, from an accredited college or university will be not only valid in US, but wherever you go around the globe, it will be equally accepted. Uh, we have seven such centers in India, Education USA Advising Centers in India. We have centers in Abhinavad, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Kolkata, and New Delhi. If you are 
uh, in India, you can uh, uh, contact to the nearest uh, uh, advising center to a city or to your uh, place of institutions. If you are staying outside the country, you may also get the list of all advising centers around the globe using the uh, educationuss.gov website and we'll get a, a page called find an advising center. So please uh, check the list of the advising centers and you can contact any advising centers around the globe and get uh, more information about studying in the US. Uh, we provide lots of services at free of cost as well as we have membership. We have a very good resource library where we have all kinds of books and resources. Uh, like the directories of universities and colleges, for your preparation for the test, how to write good essay, etc. Everything. Uh, we conduct special information seminar because of the pandemic. We are unable to do, present any information seminar at our center. We are actually closed. We are doing everything virtually from home, and uh, we also uh, conduct uh, also host university fair fair by our alumni. Uh, we also organize a virtual fair, and there is a forthcoming virtual fair it could be in the month of October. You will, you can get the information from our website. If you take membership, you will get some individualized uh, advising set, uh, 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 support. You can talk to us one by one, and we help in uh, our students. Uh, in uh, uh, how to write a good essay, how to select institutions in different way. Uh, I will very uh, much encourage you to uh, uh, check our social media, like we have uh, Facebook, we have Instagram, we have YouTube, and we also have a Education USA India app. Probably, if you can download the app on your mobile phone, you will get regular updates on your mobile phone. You don't have to go to all the pages regularly. So you get instant information on your mobile phone by downloading this uh, app, Education USA India app. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our co-presenters. We are very lucky to have diverse presenters from two different kind of uh, institutions. Uh, Dr. Dola Shaha, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Albany, Sunni, which is also known as State University of New York, Albany. And I also want to mention that Professor uh, Saha has also done his master's as well as PhD degree from University of Colorado and Boulder. So uh, she will be able to give information both from both perspective as a student as well as a faculty member. And we are also very lucky to have uh, Mr. Corey J. Mayers is a very experienced uh, admission official, currently the director of en enrollment management, Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs uh, at the University of uh, at the Syracuse University, New York. And at the Maxwell uh, uh, School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, they offer various fields of studies under the uh, humanities and social sciences like anthropology, history. Uh, sociology, economics, psychology. So Dr. Corey has really very uh, 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 good information about all this field. And he has also served uh, many other institutions. Like last time, he, he was the uh, assistant dean of enrollment management and director of admissions, uh, graduate school of education at the University of Buffalo. That was another uh, state university like SUNY Albany. And finally, my name is Sudarshan Sa. I am one of the Education USA advisors uh, at the United States India Education Foundation, Kolkata. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that I have been advising students for about two decades. I started advising in the year 2000, and since then I'm advising many students. And many of my advisees are currently doing very well in the US. With that short introductions about the presenters, I will now start my presentation. Uh, in this uh, presentation, so after my presentation is over, Dr. Dola Shah will take, and then eventually uh, Mr. Cody Myers. And finally, we will take the question and answer after the, the presentation is over. All the presentations are over. A uh, PhD application, that art of communication. So there are a uh, few questions that you can see uh, in the chat uh, of screen. Uh, why and who should you communicate with? Is this mandatory in the uh, 
application process what is the appropriate time for communication so getting answer all all of all these three questions are very very important so what I, what i will do instead of going uh, directly to these uh, questions uh, i will a uh, little bit talk about the difference between the masters and phd admissions some of you may know but others may may not be aware about that so i think it is important to little bit give information about the uh, admission process in the two uh, degree programs uh, masters and phd generally the masters degree is uh, can be completed in uh, two, two years 18 to 24 months there are few masters degree program which can be completed in one year but on an average it is uh, 18 to 24 months whereas the length of phd program can take 5 to 7 years so it's a long time investment you have to have confidence that you can complete the phd program in 5 to 7 years and the average intake for the masters degree uh, for the in, in any graduate department can vary from 30 to 80 students maybe more so if you look at the average intake of a phd program which is approximately 5 to 15 students so 15 means it's a very large department 5 is 5 to 10 is average intake so the intake in the master level is high intake in the phd level is very very limited uh comparing to the intake if you look at the admissions uh, competitiveness uh master degree the admission is less competitive and unless you are applying to some very top schools whereas admission to phd programs are very very competitive because the intakes are very very limited only 5 to 15 and the finally what is more important for the graduate applicants to know that there are less chances of getting financial aid at master degree it is true that getting admission at the master degree level is easy but at the same time it is difficult for you to get full or substantial financial aid at the master degree level of course there are some students get substantial or full financial aid but that is very very limited and very competitive whereas if you look at the phd admissions a uh, majority of phd applicants or uh, admitted students get full or substantial financial aid if i give you more clear picture in stem fields in science engineering mathematics technology more than 80% students get full funding like they are fully funded and in humanities and social sciences uh, i can say roughly 60% of students get full or substantial financial aid uh also if you have already attended our basic orientation session you have already gone through this five steps uh, we always uh, talk about your five steps to study in the us this is a very important basic orientation session so you get the overall application process from these five steps but here i am highlighting three first three steps research your option finance your studies and complete your applications so among these first three steps the first one research your options and the third one complete your applications are the most important uh, uh, steps in the application process depending on these two steps your uh, future will be depending like the outcome of your admission uh, of, uh, applications will be depending so the timeline for doing this the first day is april to july the best timing and for completing applications is september to december generally the application deadline starts from first week of december so you need to complete your application by that time so the timeline for the two states are uh, research your uh, options research your options april to july and complete your application september to december now i will look at those three questions that we have mentioned at the beginning but i am not responding to this questions directly but instead i am presenting uh, some uh, 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 information from a uh, various university website i have particularly selected information from four different kinds of uh, department from different institutions so that you get a very clear information there are two things that you have to very carefully uh read the instruction and information provided in the university website 
and then you have to decide what you need to do. So this is two way communication. You need to understand what they are expecting and then what you need to do. If you look at the first uh, panel, I have highlighted the positions in uh, yellow. Uh, if you look at the para first para, applications are required to establish correspondence with one or more potential research advisors uh, in the biological science department prior to submitting your applications. You should mention these individuals in your statement of purpose, explain how your interests match the research programs. The most important information provided here, applicants who have not discussed with faculty their interest in the program are unlikely to be admitted. So this is a very important information that you have to carefully consider. So if you are applying to any department, if you're not following that, then you are wasting your time and money to apply to that department. Let us look at another, another department from another university. The doctoral degree is based on coursework as well as research that leads to a dissertation. It is recommended that students interested in the doctoral degree contact the faculty whose interest based field his or her interest. So this is also similar information to the AVOP, but here, are, here you will find other information also important. Areas of research focus center around these topics, computer security and, inf <coughs> sorry, and information assurance, software engineering and systems, bioinformatics, and biomedical computing, networking and mobile computing, uh, privacy computing and embedded systems, machine intelligence, robotics, and algorithms and theory. So if you're applying to this department, your research areas should be aligned with one of these areas mentioned in the uh, 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 institutional website. So you have to carefully uh, look at this information. I will look at Two more such uh, things. Um, one is from the anthropology department. It is also mentioned that as such, it is important for the applicant to consider their interest in the field and the extent to which they are com complemented by the interest of our faculty members. So you will not get that kind of instruction only in the STEM field, in the non-STEM field and humanities and social sciences, you will also get similar kind of uh, information. The other information from the universe, uh, Department of History, it says the Department of History accept application for MA in History, MA in History through the Public History Program and PhD in History. Students entering PhD program with an MA may also earn an MA in History. Admission is offered for fall only and do not allow deferred admissions. We encourage prospective students to start an email dialogue with one or two faculty members in the area of your research interest. Now, there are three important information I want to share with this uh, 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 particular Department of History. One is, uh, number one, the Department of History of this particular university offer both MA as well as PhD. In many cases, you will find many gadget departments may not offer master's degree. So if you apply for MS, they may not consider your applications. They only accept PhD, but in this case, they accept both MA as well as PhD. The second important information is that even if you do not have a bachelor's degree, master's degree, you can still apply directly for PhD, but in course of your PhD program, you will eventually get in MA in history. That's another information. And finally, uh, that you have to, to contact the faculty member. You may not get this kind of transparent information in all university or department websites. Sometimes you may get information also in different location of the university or the, or the admission page. So this is one information um, kind of extracted from one of the admission page. Uh, it give instruction about the personal statement or statement of purpose, which is not our uh, uh, point of discussion today, statement of purpose, because there is a session next week. But what is important in the statement of purpose, it's mentioned item number four, potential faculty members and the area of research the applicant is interested in uh, working with. So you have to mention that in the statement of purpose. Now, I have also mentioned some gadget departments may not have the same policy. 
uh, you know, in the uh, U.S. universities, the graduate admission process actually vary from department to department. Even within the same university, you know, what the department of history uh, decide may not be the same to the department of engineering. So you must get the authentic information from the admission page as, as well as from the department page. There are many graduate departments may not encourage you to directly write to the faculty member also. Please remember that. So in that case, what happens, uh, some graduate departments, uh, they may accept you for the PhD program and they may have a committee and then they will allow you to work with multiple uh, professors and work in their lab. You may be working in say two or three labs with two or three professors. And then after one year or so, the committee will decide who you work with or they may give you some uh, um, 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 options to select one of the professors. In other case, you may not have any liberty to select on your own. So it varies from department to department and uh, university to university. So you have to carefully look at the information, read the inf instruction line by line, word by word, and then proceed and apply to your desired institution and de desired department. Communication with faculty members is very, very important. Uh, you need to contact one or two faculty members in each university in your desired field or specialization or in your desired research interest area. You will find the list of faculty members on each university, each department website. You can get the details about the research interest and you get the CV and you may also get what kind of research work they're doing. You can do also some uh, 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 search on the Google, Google uh, 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 scholars site and you can find out details about the, about the faculty. Uh, you may also communicate with multiple faculty from different departments provided you have interest in interdisciplinary field. For an example, one of my advices uh, currently doing PhD in University of Miami, he is actually a student of computer science doing PhD in computer science, but he is doing uh, research in an interdisciplinary field. And now he is doing research, a combined research with humanity, sorry, sociology and computer science. So if you have that kind of interdisciplinary uh, research interest, you may also contact with other uh, professor of other department. Do your research before writing to faculty member. That is very, very important. Go through the website, go through the faculty members details, their uh, 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 publications, the kind of work they have done, and try to understand what kind of research they have done and uh, take important notes from those. And what is most important is giving up some simple key questions, asking really good question is a form of art and you have to learn that art because we are a graduate students you will be going for phd level of education so you have to ask wise questions so ask some simple wise questions uh, <clears throat> then uh, you need to organize the key information that you want to share with your faculty when you write to them and I will strongly encourage you to use technology nowadays. You can use various kinds of technology, various kind of uh, social uh, media uh, to present yourself, uh, like self-branding, sell yourself, marketing yourself. Let me give you an example of very poorly composed communications. So if you look at this uh, example of poorly, very poorly communi uh, composed communication, you will have some idea in this case, the students really do, did not follow any, any kind of grammatical or uh, English punctuations. And in some cases, uh, did not follow the proper way of writing the name of university. Like if you have written the name of the university, the University of Georgia, the university, the first name of the, the first letter of the university should be in capital U and Georgia should be capital uh, G. So there are many things, if you look at that, uh, uh, the second para also, the comma is uh, placed after one space of sad. So the comma and full stop, semicolon always come, come after the word. 
So you have to learn all this of grammar, punctuations, and right uh, right way of and send right way of communications with the faculty. Uh, let me also discuss how to compose effective communications. Most important is the subject line, which actually convey the core message of the uh, 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 email. And you have to properly salute the professors you are writing to. Uh, maintain professional mannerism, like dear Professor Wilson, do not write hi Wilson or something like that. Even that is commonly used in the US system, but you may not use that one. So so respect because you are writing to faculty member at that faculty those faculty member may be from different part of the world so they may not uh, always uh, uh, follow this uh, the same way that we communicate introductions very concise one or two lines uh, who you are and what is your academic plan then academic experience as a graduate applicants you do not need to talk about your school educations just provide very little information about your bachelor's, master's degree level educations. Give emphasis on research and professional experience. Put about two to three bullet points and give concise information about the faculty have worked with the, uh, the topic. Uh, if you have already published paper on that or something like that. And ask some simple question that I have mentioned on it also. You need to ask questions uh, which can be answered by your faculty at the very beginning of your uh, communication. You are uh, starting establishment with uh, 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 faculty. So you do you cannot, cannot expect lots of uh, feedback from the faculty member. Never ask questions related to funding, etc. And you have to close the email effectively. And in the signature column, try to provide complete information about who you are your email ID, contact information, if you're a student, sorry, uh, professionals, and provide the links if you have some professional site also. Uh, there are some do's and do nots. Uh, uh, pay attention to grammar, punctuation, spelling under the do. Use standard font uh, for the entire communication. Very, very important. Proofread a couple of times before you send any communications. Please have patience. You can't expect immediate response from the professor because they are very busy. They get emails from hundreds of people, hundreds of people every day. And there are some important do not. You do not use capital letters, too many capital letters in the uh, words, in the uh, communications. Do not use too many bold letters. Do not try to use color font except the hyperlinks and avoid attaching any document. Some uh, university uh, uh, web mail system may bar any uh, communication with attachment. And most important is do not send a generic email. I have got to know from many of our presenters from the US universities, they often get generic email from the students and they send the same email to multiple professors in the same department. This is a very serious mistake made by the professor. So I have given a quote in the bottom of this uh, slide from a students who have who were who was frustrated to write to many university but eventually got response from uh, 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 the graduate coordinator so depending on the communications and the uh, the, uh, the professor you may get a response do not send a reminder immediately after one or two days wait for some days such so sell yourself, create your own home profile. You can use LinkedIn or you can create your web page. I have given you a good example of my former advices. Both of us are currently studying in the US. One is in Northeastern. The other students are in Milatro, who is currently doing PhD in uh, University of Texas, Austin. So create your own profile and provide all kinds of information there. You can share that link with the professor when you communicate, they can get any kind of information they're looking from from your profile or web page. So that's a way you can sell yourself, present yourself, better way to the faculty, to the department. Uh, you should also communicate with the graduate coordinator or the chair uh, who will be the point of contact. 
Um, you can uh, check up uh, with them about the admission requirement, about eligibility, financial aid, communications with the faculty. Sometimes you may not be encouraged to communicate with the faculty, but you can also uh, check with the uh, graduate coordinator. So suppose your GPA is uh, less than 3.5 in your master's degree, uh, and you want to apply, you can ask the graduate coordinator whether with 3.2 in your master's, whether you can apply. Uh, uh, then uh, in one university, uh, it says in the requirements, we need 100 and above in the profile in the biological science. So if you have say 95 in the profile and you want to apply to the department, you can ask the graduate coordinator in the, uh, whether with 95, whether that will be accepted. Another question is like that, sometimes you may not get a very clear instructions or information about the minimum score. So you can I also ask the graduate coordinator or the chair, what will be the minimum score, whether they will consider the score that you have. This is a very uh, good, ex this is a good example of communications, uh, good communications actually. So you may think about designing um, um, such communications, uh, maintaining proper para and asking questions uh, legitimately that will help uh, the other side, people on the other side to get information very quickly and they may uh, respond to your questions. Let us give a few seconds to read this actually. Just about to. Uh, I will not take much time on the other other uh, essays and uh, uh, writing samples. Just one thing I just want to identify. Uh, personal history and diversity statement is completely different of the difference from the statement of purpose. So you have to be careful about when any department asking for personal history or diversity statement. Uh, so check uh, check it clearly and you may get some clear information or may not. Uh, such uh, uh, clear information, but you have to carefully um, uh, make it different from the statement of partners. With that, I will end my presentation. I've taken more than say, 20 minutes. Sorry, Dola uh, uh, and uh, Cody. Uh, I will hand over the platform to Dola. Thank you, Sudarshan. It was a great presentation and most of the points that you mentioned are, are really great. I will try not to cover those points again in my presentation because I have some of those common as well. Um, so uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I, I am an assistant professor at the electrical and computer engineering department at University at Albany, uh, State University of New York. Um, a, a, a lot of the states or most of the states in the United States um, has state universities. These are public universities and State University of New York is the largest um, uh, in, in the whole, the SUNY system is the largest one in the whole United uh, States. Um, I am the co-director uh, of the MESA lab. Um, that's, that's a lab that we have uh, within the um, department. And I am also the program director of the department. And I am also holding uh, um, a position in the SUNY Innovation Policy Board. So this is my current uh, system, with my, my current position. And what I would like to talk about a little bit is, uh, I think Sudarshan also mentioned that I did my undergraduate from India. I did my master's and PhD in university at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. And so I can give you perspective of both from student perspective and faculty perspective. I have seen both the sides. Um, I applied and I was applying in different universities. I shortlisted and then how I have gone through that process. And then after that, I uh, have seen multiple universities after I started at Albany. Um, and and I, I am in the graduate admission committee as well. So I, I see both the sides. Okay, so the, re the views that I'll be presenting today, these are all mine, and this does not reflect anything about University at Albany's policies and rules. So 
another important point that I would like to mention here is my views are mostly related to engineering fields. Many of them can be translated to some other fields, but it might not be 100% same in, for example, history or, or economics um, or, or business, for example. So, so I would say that um, do your own research as well uh, on, on these topics. So there are two parts of, of the system. First is you have to prepare yourself. And that's the first part. That's the major part of getting an admission in a, in a uh, US uh, university. So uh, unless you do that part, whatever you communicate with the faculty, it really doesn't matter. So you have to do a good project. You should start with a good project. I would say if you are doing your undergrad, uh, talk to your faculty in your department, in your undergraduate institution. Work on a project that is meaningful, that you really like, that you are passionate about. Do not try to do too many projects at the same time, because that would lead you to uh, um, an, an end quality of each one of them, which are not really good. So once you start working in that project, probably in your third year or, or uh, even earlier, uh, if you are willing to uh, get ahead of uh, the curve, uh, you, you try to publish papers either in your undergraduate or graduate. So the, the papers, there are many conferences that are happening in India. And oftentimes those might be regional conferences. Those might be um, conferences that are uh, hosted by the university itself. So look for those and try to uh, publish a paper a technical content which you can showcase how you are eligible to go, do a good research in a topic. And then the, the last one is get your degree for which you need the GBA. If you do not have good GBA, uh, we are going to ask question, is this student really going to flourish or, or not? Because it's not easy. Um, you can. Uh, you have to remember that you can get into a PhD by just doing a BS or BTech or BE. Uh, so with your undergraduate degree, you should be able to get into many PhD granting institutions for a PhD program. Uh, not all, but many. And MS is good, but it's oftentimes it's not necessary. But having an MS degree, you will be able to get to do many of these uh, work other, other aspects that I'm talking about, like working on projects, publishing paper and other things. And then the second part is communication. So although the arrow might show that one is leading to another, uh, you're preparing yourself and communication may happen at the same time. So your communication may happen in the, la in the final year while you're still working on your last piece of the project. Um, and, and over there, first, you would need to do your research about faculty and then you need to shortlist. And that's, that's where I, I call it a, a matchmaking because it's not just one-sided, it's two-sided. So you need to understand the faculty as well as the faculty needs to understand you. And then finally, you, you are writing an email to the faculty that um, I am a student, I would like to do research in your area and, and other things that um, Sudarshan already mentioned. So there are basically two parts. So first of all, why is it important to communicate? The main point is that application process is expensive. There are thousands of universities where you can essentially go to, but how will you know who is accepting um, the, the uh, application in your domain of research or in your um, interest area. And it is a process for you to know as well, because during the time of initial uh, conversation, you will get to know your potential advisor, possibly your potential lab mates, because oftentimes, uh, uh, if there is a, a good match, then uh, a faculty might introduce you to, to the other uh, students in the lab. Um, their work ethics and everything. So it's very important to just to communicate first before blindly sending out your application. 
Um, and most universities, if you are looking for engineering, they would like you to identify faculty during the ap application process. So when you're starting the application at that time, if you are trying to look for the faculty, it might be too late to understand. So you do your homework first, look up uh, faculty whom you can identify and work with. So going back to prepare yourself for PhD, how you can prepare yourself, you have to have a high GPA. Everybody wants to um, get their students who are good in what they are supposed to do. Um, GRE TOEFL scores, um, some schools are now not looking at GRE TOEFL scores. And this is something new uh, that, that is happening. That does not mean that it is not required. I would still say that most of the university are still looking at GRE and TOEFL scores. So it is important to have that so that that opens up most of the other universities. Um, it is important to have early exposure to research, um, publish papers or submitted papers. You need to showcase some, some capability of your research. So these are important. Um, 10 years ago, when, when I was applying, I had many papers, but most of the students, I would say over 90% of students at that time, when they were applying, they did not have as many papers that I did. But that's a different story. Now, in 2020, when I see the applications, PhD applications that are coming in, or, or whoever is asking me, most of them has at least one or two submitted papers, one might be published, uh, and, and something like that, at least they have. So this part has become a, a more critical part or critical component for a PhD admission. And uh, you, you can also ask for a reference. Uh, if you are working with a faculty in your institution for your undergraduate thesis, undergraduate project, or your uh, uh, master's uh, thesis, you, you, you are working with an advisor at your home institute. So ask that faculty <clears throat> whether that person has a collaborator uh, in the United States. And, and that way it becomes easier for you to introduce yourself that you are working with that faculty. But, but again, this is not required. It is not required. Uh, I, I would emphasize this that I, I um, have seen uh, most of the of the students getting admitted without any of and without the last point there. So how to find faculty? People talk always talk about um, universities. I take a different stance on this because it is very difficult to go through all the universities. United States is a large country. We have 50 states, six time zones, and hundreds of research active universities. So the reason why I said hundreds, because there are different categories of universities and R1 universities, we have hundreds of those, which are very high active research universities. And within the New York state, we have 11 of those. So it's, it's a lot to actually find those universities. So we have very high active, then um, um, high active, and then there are R3 and R4 type of uh, category universities. And each university has multiple departments and each department has multiple faculty. So how will you find a faculty who is working in your concentration area or your area that you are interested in? Because you are not interested in department. PhD is a very, very narrow area. And within one department, there are different areas or sub areas that faculty are working in. And, and one area you might notice, unless you are um, in MIT or, or Berkeley, you might have many areas where uh, you don't have um, a faculty in that area. So how will you actually find it? And, and I really like this um, <clears throat> comic from PhD Comics is uh, what you know is actually going down uh, and what you know about that one particular topic gets more and more. So you know a lot about one very teeny tiny topic once you're close to your PhD. So PhD is that narrow. So how are you going to find a faculty 
to whom you can write. You cannot write thousands of emails to faculty, which are not generic, by the way. And, and please do not write generic emails. <laughs> so I, 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 I do it in a way to find the faculty and not find the university. So you should try to, um, so if you have done your um, bachelor's project or master's project and thesis, you might have done some related work study. So who are the um, faculty who has published recently in that area? So you might have chosen those references that, well, I'm doing something better than existing work. So go find those faculty, go find the web pages of those faculty and, and try to connect. So that, that's one way. Also, if you have done your initial study, um, writing a, a paper, for example, you already know probably which is, uh, uh, what are some of the good conferences in that area. So once you know that which are the good conferences in that area, um, not all conferences are, are really top conferences and you have to know that because you, you should shoot for, aim for high not, not um, absolute low. So once you go to that top conference, you can open up what are the papers that are being um, published or, or that, that, that are there in the agenda, and then try to find those faculty. Most of the time, the name of the faculty is the last one in the, in the paper, uh, in, in the paper uh, author list. So that way you will be able to identify a faculty member whom you have, you will find a, a relation. And, and then you can also ask your BS or MS advisor that um, how can I uh, uh, find faculty or, or do you know any faculty who is working in that particular area? Maybe that's robotics, maybe that's um, wireless networking. Um, so, so ask that question um, to someone uh, who can be your mentor. And then ask a senior if you have one who is currently pursuing PhD in the United States. So you will know from their perspective uh, if they know any other faculty. So there are these four methods of trying to find a faculty. Now, once you find faculty, you might end up actually finding 50 of them who are working in your chosen area. So I would say first, shortlist the faculty who are active in research because oftentimes you will see faculty um, names which are there in the in the university web page um, and the department page but they might not be active in research anymore they might be uh, uh, professor emeritus or, or they are not active they are teaching uh, mostly at that time and you wouldn't know very well unless you actually find their publication that are that are uh, um, in, in um, last two or three years, I would say. <clears throat> also remember, they can be from different departments. So many of these um, um, faculty might actually be in different departments. For example, um, robotics. We have a robotics faculty in the electrical and computer engineering department. Another robotics faculty is in computer science department. So, that's, that's what you have to figure out, where do you belong? Um, I am, uh, I, I got my PhD in computer science, but right now uh, I am in electrical and computer engineering department. So you can see that we go from one department to another department with the core being, um, being separate. Um, and again, go to their webpage. Some of them has specifically written what if you are, an interested PhD student, follow these instructions. So some of them has done a very good job in, in actually guiding you what they're looking for when you are applying or when you are writing that email. Um, read some of the recent publications because even when I say that um, <clears throat> robotics, for example, robotics can take different uh, forms. It can be algorithm, it can be uh, um, control theory. So there are two different um, different zones. Um, I work in wireless communication, so I can be writing papers which are 100% theoretical, mathematical, and then another uh, day I can be writing something which is very much hands-on, very realistic, very practical, actually working on hardware. Um, so there could be different flavors of the same topic, and, and you need to know what you are comfortable with. 
So I would say uh, start reading their publication. And if you read the one paper, you do not understand anything other than the title, then probably it's time to stop because that is the area that you do not understand. You might think that the name might be catchy, but you don't understand anything. So I would say that stop if you do not understand anything in the paper and maybe move on to the next faculty and try to see whether there is a better fit or not. Um, I wouldn't go into the details of what should be there in the email because Sudarshan did a great job in actually uh, emphasizing what should be there in the, in, in the email. Um, you should draft an email uh, first and then subject line is important, content is important, where I would say, make it concise. Do not write long paragraphs. Um, it is very, very important to highlight your achievements. And uh, oftentimes in, in engineering, especially, I would say that uh, you should also highlight your domain specific tools. When I say domain specific tools, it is very, very specific to what you have done and that is rare to find in a P, in a in other applicants. For example, if I say that, well, if you write uh, a line that you are proficient in Microsoft Word and Excel, that's not domain specific tool. That's an eight year old can do. So you have to write what is very, very specific, not a programming language, but if you are working on a specific hardware, for example, uh, which is very rare to find in, in, in India, then you should highlight that. So that's that's the level uh, where, where uh, you should highlight that what you have done. Um, so uh, in, in wireless networking, we work with some of the radios, which we call USRP. And if you write somewhere that, well, I have experience working with USRP, that goes a long way. So uh, remember to highlight whatever domain specific knowledge you have. If you are in, uh, working on information theory and you do not need that, you are working only on mathematical side of things, you do not need that. You should be proficient with that itself. Um, in the content, you should talk about your research papers. And uh, well, I would differ here a little bit and it de de uh, depends from one uh, to another university. I have received many which actually has CV attached with one or two selected publications. So it gives me a quick chance to look through and, and respond than just um, um, not do it. But, but don't make the CV to be really grand and, and just uh, 10 page long or, or uh, like putting your pictures so that it becomes long, it becomes uh, like multiple MB uh, megabytes of size. Don't do that. And, and check for grammar and typos and then even now, uh, when I send an important email, I, I try to read it, read it many, many times and try to see whether what I'm trying to say is really conveying, conveying or not. <clears throat> so do that before, hand, before hand, hitting the send button. And <clears throat> so we do get not only emails from graduate students or prospective graduate students, but also for many different things, for teaching, for research, for service, for many different things all the time. Um, like if I am talking now, I keep receiving emails and it's very important for you to make sure that you get my attention among all of those emails. So you have to be creative. There is no one way to this. But again, do not use too many colors, red, blue, green everywhere. Please do not do that. Um, keep a generic font uh, because it's not only important to be same font throughout the email, but also do not write something like um, uh, fonts which are hard to read. <clears throat> Times New Roman uh, uh, is, is one example you can use, which is very nice uh, and easy to read. Also remember not to oversell or undersell yourself. Why do I say that? Because sometimes I see that uh, students keep um, saying things which they are not really capable of. So do not try to, if you just know a name, uh, for example, you have heard about FPGA, so you write that there, but you really don't know much about it. 
So when you have a conversation with a faculty member, the faculty member will easily be able to uh, figure that out that, well, this is something that the student has over oversold. And also undersell meaning that if you have um, something that, uh, that needs to be showcased and you are not, not uh, saying that or highlighting that, you should highlight that very well that yes, you have, uh, you, you have uh, been participating in math Olympiad, for example. So, so remember those things that what matters uh, and what showcases your technical capability. Um, for example, if you are, um, if you are really good at uh, sports, for example, so you, you played um, uh, badminton, let's say, you don't need to write that when you are asking for your PhD in computer science, for example, or electrical and computer engineering. That's okay to write it in your CV somewhere, but uh, it's not what a faculty is looking at or trying to find in, in, in the small, concise email that we are trying to set, uh, read uh, and parse at the same time. And we also do not um, ask for assistance. This is because that when a faculty will show interest in your CV and will uh, show interest to talk to you, chances are very, very high that um, the faculty will provide either research assistantship or there is a, a possibility of getting a teach, teaching assistantship in that, in that uh, way. So it is expected that uh, it is never expected that a student is going to join PhD without funding. So asking is for assistantship is, is unnecessary at that point. <clears throat> so writing samples, some of the universe, when you, and the writing sample is required, or when I'm talking about writing sample, it is when you're actually in the application process. Many universities do need the writing sample and check the requirement. Every university, every department is different. Um, and some of the examples, if, if it, even if it is not required, you, that's where you can send some of the examples for the whole committee to look at. Uh, you, can, you, you can receive a response for a video call very quickly saying that, well, uh, let's talk over um, a, a Zoom meeting, let's say. And if that happens, that's great, then your, your email has been noticed. Now, once you are there, what, what, what do you expect there in that email? So this is a part of communication as well. So the first question that a, a faculty might ask you is why are you interested in PhD? Because we need to know that you will be able to stay afloat for five to seven years uh, for PhD, it's, it's a tough journey and, and you need to be that much focused and you need to have a purpose unless you have that. After six months, it will say that I'm not going to be here. Goodbye, I'm going back. So you need to be that confident and we want to see that uh, in you. And what are your technical capabilities? So, so the, uh, the faculty is going to ask you what about your research paper or the, or the uh, uh, publication that you have said. And over there, if you have not done, if it's, a, if it's a paper that you have submitted or send across which has five authors and your name was there just because you, was, you were there in the group and you did not um, do much of the work. And that, that is the point then um, your, the faculty is going to ask you question to figure out how much do you really know about that paper that you have uh, pushed up? Um, what you should do is you should ask questions about the lab, about ongoing research, how projects are assigned, how, how do you interact and all of these things. And after this conversation, um, there might be a possibility that you, the faculty might introduce you to one of the PhD students in the lab or, or someone else to talk more if there is a really good match. Some advisors or some faculty do not do that. They just ask you to uh, um, um, start a, 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 an application. And the, you should write your intent to join the faculty's lab in that statement of purpose. Somewhere in the statement of purpose, you should write that 
um, I, if given a chance, you would need you would like to join this faculty's lab because of whatever research that you are uh, interested in. Now, once you send the email, if you do not receive a response in a week, so do not, as Sudarshan mentioned, that do not immediately uh, next morning do not send an email again. Um, just wait. If you do not receive a response in a week, send a polite reminder. Remember um, to say that you, you, you might be busy. Uh, can you please uh, provide your feedback on my uh, credibility and other things? Um, just do not say, I did not respond. I received encouragement to apply that does not guarantee admission. You have to find multiple matches in different universities. So you have to talk to multiple of these faculty and apply at multiple universities. Um, and, and then you can get multiple offers. I would uh, discourage you to apply to only one university because if that one fails for whatever reason, you do not have a backup. Uh, if you have applied for um, to at least um, in, so eight to 10 is a good number in my opinion. If you have more, you can shoot for more, or if you uh, want to do less, that's fine as well. But one is not a good number. You can go for five, let's say for five different universities. Um, they, they are, according to your uh, understanding, they should be all different kinds. Um, and then um, you, you should apply for multiple of these universities. Now, what happens if you do not get any response, either during interaction or admission? So um, it, it might as well be possible that you've written to 50 different faculty all, uh, and, and you do not, did not um, get a response. So I would say there are two ways to handle this. First of all, if you do not get interaction at all from any of the faculty, that means that probably you do not have the credentials that is required for PhD in these universities or with these faculty. So another option is to apply for a master's degree and then improve your credentials. And then the second part is that if you want to do that, you can also do, a, you can re-strategize next year and it depends on how you're re-strategizing. So you can re-strategize and then apply next year as well. So these are the two options that you have. And with that, uh, I would say good luck to all of you. And um, it's uh, to Corey. Thank you, Dola. Okay, um, I see we're a little behind schedule. So I I'm good at making up time. So I will go rather quickly. Um, much of what Sudarshan and Dola spoke about is in what I'm going to say as well. So there, there definitely are differences in um, applying to a school of engineering and computer science versus school of social science, um, but there also are a lot of similarities. Um, so just a little bit about the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. It is um, a school of social science combined with a professional school of public and international affairs. Um, the Maxwell School has been ranked number one um, in graduate education public affairs for the past 25 years. Um, and we have a number of top ranked specialties. Um, PhD programs that the Maxwell School has are in a range of social sciences, um, anthropology, economics, you can see them all here. Um, we also have a number of interdisciplinary research centers that students in our PhD programs can do research through. So I listed some examples, but there are over, um, well, within the Maxwell School, there are 10 research centers at Syracuse University as a whole.